It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the University of Chester uh, for this, our first inaugural lecture for the academic year 2015-2016. <coughs> a few points of housekeeping. Um, the comfort stations are round the corner uh, where you came in. Uh, we are not expecting uh, a fire test, so if there is an alarm going off, follow me rapidly uh, outside to the, uh, to the green via the various exits. <coughs> here, one there and one at the back. Um, it is a tradition now, I suppose this is its 18th year where we've had uh, inaugural uh, lectures by our professoriate. And it's part of the increasing uh, emphasis on research uh, that the university has. And it's an opportunity to celebrate the distinguished nature of our professors, uh, what they profess, what they have to say. And we celebrate it uh, with this event, and quite properly so. It is an extremely important uh, aspect for us to claim uh, the contribution that they made. The university is now in its 176th year and uh, it has a very broad range of disciplines, uh, literally everything from archaeology to zoology and most things in between. And the university is marked by a continuing uh, regard for teacher training. It was the reason that we came into uh, existence uh, founded in 1839 under the aegis of uh, the Church of England for the training of school masters, and it was in those days definitely masters who were trained. But part and parcel of the university is that it is and continues to be an Anglican foundation. And we've always had aspects of religious studies throughout its 176 years. But more recently, in the last 30 years or so, uh, we have been exploring a number of new disciplines, a number of new areas. And significant in that area, and very special to the university, is theology and religious studies. Through our work with sister colleges and our work with a number of institutions, both in the United Kingdom and abroad, we are one of the largest providers of courses in theology, religious studies, biblical studies, um, and in fact I think that will be featured prominently uh, in the Church Times, uh, probably early in the new year. But as I say, these occasions are very much about giving an opportunity to distinguished colleagues to engage with an audience, some of which will be highly knowledgeable of the discipline, many like me will not, and it's a, a challenge uh, for any inaugural lecture to capture those two uh, extreme wings or uh, that kind of uh, broad church in every sense of the word. It gives me great pleasure to call on my colleague, uh, our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Rob Warner to introduce our professorial inaugurate. Well, I add my greeting to that of the Vice Chancellor on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, welcoming especially those here tonight from uh, the William Temple Foundation, who I see have brought a banner with them, and very good it is too. Professor Chris Baker is William Temple Professor of Religion and Public Life at the University and Director of Research for the William Temple Foundation. His post is generously supported by funding from the Church of England Colleges Fund, which Dr Wayne Morris secured on Chris' behalf. Chris completed his doctoral thesis on religion in New Towns in 2002 at the University of Manchester. 
His early postdoctoral research explored the role of churches in urban regeneration, areas of Manchester, from which he developed ideas of spiritual capital as the energizing and motivating force that generates faith-based social capital. This work brought him into contact with several key thinkers in political geography with whom he has developed and continues to develop ideas around how faith groups both shape and are shaped by the cultural and political context around them. Chris has been a major contributor to the development of the concept of the post-secular city, as well as mapping innovative case studies of religious secular partnership. A large Leverhulme grant about 10 years ago saw him develop his work in spiritual capital across several faith traditions. It highlighted how the structures of belonging, becoming and participation are integral to the understanding of how faith groups contribute to civil society. These ideas have taken him into new collaborations with both philosophers of religion but also social policy experts attempting to understand how we might create a renewed understanding of religion fit for the 21st century in all its ambiguous complexity. He is also committed with his colleagues in the department to developing a public and political theology that engages critically but fluently with the intense social, political and economic shifts that characterise our current age. His latest AHRC research project with Professor Adam Dinham at Goldsmiths College, University of London, is entitled Reimagining Religion and Belief for Public Policy and Practice. It seeks to engage the latest thinking and research within arts and humanities on religion with government, local authorities and public bodies in the UK and across Australia, North America and Scandinavia. Chris's publications include Hybrid Church in the City, Post-Secular Cities, Christianity and the New Social Order with John Atherton and John Reader, a philosophy of Christian materialism with John Reader and Tom James. His next volume, entitled Post-Secular Geographies, Re-Envisioning Politics, Subjectivity and Ethics, will be published by Routledge in 2016. As an act of optimistic faith, I invite you before the lecture to express your appreciation as Chris takes the platform. Uh, Vice Chancellor, Dean, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends and family, thank you so much for coming this evening. And I know some of you have come a considerable distance so a special thank you to you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank both the William Temple Foundation and the University of Chester for co-funding this professorial post and giving me such an interesting and full life. This post represents a growing partnership between two institutions who are both committed to empirical and interdisciplinary understanding of how religion is lived and performed in the public sphere in ways which address both those inside as well as outside faith communities. Finally, I'd like to thank the university for this sumptuous occasion and in particular to Jenny Westcott who has done such a great job organising this event. I speak as a public theologian shaped by the Christian tradition but shaped by many other things besides. It is a huge privilege to take up a professorial post founded in the name of William Temple. Temple for me is my ghostly mentor, my spirit guide, who has profoundly shaped my thinking and research over the years. In preparing for this lecture, I tried to boil down his thinking into four principles that for me underpin a progressive global ethic of change. The first principle is a sense that the whole material world is imbued with divine sacramentality, 
because there is a divine will and mind that is calling it and shaping it into being. We live, claimed Temple, in a sacramental universe in which both the material and the spiritual are deeply intertwined. Within Temple's philosophical and theological framework, this sacramental reality is historically manifest in the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth, God's word, or the divine logos, made flesh. The second principle, and flowing directly from this sacramental vision, is that therefore we are called into a moral and political relationship with the universe. And we have a mandate to co-create with the divine a social order on earth that aspires towards, but also contains within it, the kingdom of God, which Temple sometimes rephrased, and I think I prefer this, as the commonwealth of value. Third principle is that this invitation to participate in the creation of the commonwealth of value involves a compassionate pragmatism uh, to work with all the creative, moral, and scientific tools available to us that will inspire and guide us. It involves us learning from others and working alongside others. Temple called this a vocation of service. And he implemented these principles in his vital work, building the foundations for a comprehensive and universal post-war welfare state before he died in 1944. Finally, Temple articulated a theological realism that expresses a grounded but not naive basis for hope. For him, human propensity towards evil threatens to undermine, but never totally extinguishes, the excess value we create when we work together to co-construct the commonwealth of value. Such a realist perspective acknowledges the messiness and complexity of the task of co-creation, what it involves on the ground. The situation that requires what my friend and colleague John Reader has brilliantly defined as an openness to engaging in multiple and entangled fidelities. For me, Temple's well-founded pessimism in human motivation is held in tension by the wider and more long-term processes of divine love and disclosure he envisaged. So with some of these uh, key temple ideas as a framework, I will now seek to deconstruct my somewhat lengthy lecture title into four, I hope, manageable parts. An uncertain era, globalized religion, progressive change, and a new global ethic. An uncertain era. I think it's fair to say that we do live in an era of uncertainty. There is political, social, and technological uncertainty, but underpinning these things, I suggest, is a deeper moral and philosophical uncertainty. Since the turn of the century, we are deeply aware of a number of existential threats posed to us, for example, climate change, including rising sea levels and droughts, and the consequent displacement of people seeking consistent supplies of food and water. Growing fear of global health epidemics caused by new proximities and connections that are no respecters of jurisdictions or borders. Growing social and economic inequality and the profound lack of social trust and cohesion that generates. International, global and state terrorism, much of it religiously based and deploying global media to emphasize its hideous levels of barbarity. And growing global migration, much of it produced by the threats I've just mentioned, but also driven by capitalism and its need to maximize efficiency and flexibility within a single real-time market. <coughs> Closer to home, many in the UK face huge amounts of stress and anxiety, directly associated with insecurities around unemployment, relationships, poverty, housing, 
personal safety and professional attainment in an increasingly competitive world. One major contributor to human stress and anxiety is social isolation and loneliness. A recent survey put the UK at 26th out of 28 EU countries on the loneliness index. Change, flexibility, multitasking, seen the new norms that are built into the fabric of everyday life. But so is uncertainty about the future. The German social theorist Ulrich Beck anticipates our era of uncertainty with his notion of the global risk society. His core idea in a book called Risk, the New Modernity, published in 1999, was that the old and predictable modernity of the secular enlightenment was giving way to a new modernity, which was much more complex and above all, full of unintended consequences. Because of the deeply interconnected ways the world was being joined together, i.e. through the World Wide Web and closer integration of financial systems, these unintended consequences can now go viral. In fact, Beck says, the unintended consequences now grow at a faster rate than intended ones. He calls this new modernity reflexive, by which he means that the impact of our actions rebound on us, interfering with our original aspirations. These unintended consequences pose risks or dangers that sit alongside or are enfolded in our human belief in unlimited growth and development. He was particularly vexed at issues like the growth of pollution in the 1980s, which he accurately predicted would create the conditions for climate change, along with the viral distribution of financial risk, which he describes as the financial of bads, not goods. He concludes that this complexity and fluidity that we have allowed to be built into our systems has created a new global order which we are no longer, which we no longer have the means to describe or indeed control. In his last and now posthumous book, he offers an honest assessment of his own thinking. I was at a loss for an answer to the simple but necessary question. What is the meaning of the global events unfolding before our eyes? So with Beck's unnerving question ringing in our ears, I now move on to the second section of my lecture, Globalised Religion, otherwise known as Why is Religion So Big in the 21st Century? If you want to see empirically the current and projected growth in global religion, not UK religion, global religion, you need look no further than a report by the Pew Research Centre entitled The Future of World Religions, Population Growth Projections to 2010 to 2050. Funded by the Templeton Foundation and many other uh, big think tanks, it looks at a series of globally dynamic trains, trends, not trains, including age, fertility, mortality, migration, and religious switching, and applies them to eight major global groups, Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, adherents of folk religions, adherents of other religions, Baha'is, Jains, Sikhs, Taoists, etc., and the unaffiliated, those who define themselves as no religion, so not affiliated to any religion. These trends are then correlated with rates of self identification based on about two and a half thousand national censuses and surveys. So we just have a quick look at the slide that I've got up ahead of you. Uh, you'll see that in 2010, the world was pretty globally religious. 31% uh, identified as Christians, 23% as Muslims. The no religion group were, if you like, the third largest religion uh, at 16%. Hindus, 15%. Uh, Buddhists, 7 Folk religions, 9 6 uh, Other religions, 08 Jews, 02 So the total um, percentage of the globe, globe citizens uh, for religion is 84%. Their projections for 2050 actually shows that 
that already globally large percentage of religious citizens will actually grow to 87%. Uh, Christ, the Christian bloc, if you like, will remain broadly the same. Uh, the Muslim communities will rise to nearly 30%. The unaffiliated, those of no religion, will drop by 3% globally. Uh, and the other faith sections stay broadly similar. This global picture becomes more complex in a minority of Western countries which will see continuing numbers of citizens switching from mainly Christian to non-affiliated identities, i.e. no religion. So for example, in the UK, um, it's predicted that if you look at the top row, that's the, that's the uh, 2010, uh, well, based on censuses, 2050 projections, you'll see that C for Christian will decline its projected from 64 to about 45. Uh, the Muslim community will increase about 11 percent. The non-affiliated will rise to nearly 39 percent. The decisive shift in the future growth of global religion, these tables suggest, is clearly discombobulating for us in the West. I'm glad I got that word out right. One of the key assumptions of secularization theory was that as the world became more modern, measured in the development of technological innovation, scientific advancement, and industrial and urban expansion, then religion would correspondingly decline in both intellectual and political power. It would become a minority and private activity that needed the protection of the secular nation state. So one intellectual challenge immediately required by a new progressive global ethic, which is the topic of my title of my uh, lecture, is to understand that modernity and religion can and do exist side by side. And we need to find new ways of understanding how this happens and how we can make that relationship work. This message is essentially the challenge issued by both Jürgen Habermas and Ulrich Beck, who I'm going to use in this section. Both influential exponents of European social theory that emerged from the influence of the Frankfurt School of Marxist sociology. Both insist that we need a new definition, or rather a new imagination, of what modernity is. That, for me, is the very exciting question. A new imagination of what modernity is. One that fits the conditions of the 21st century, rather than perhaps harking back to the 19th or 20th. Beck as we have already seen with his idea of the globalized risk society, talks about two modernities. Modernity one, he characterizes <coughs> as ends means rationality, interests, classes, the market, science, and socially constructed nations, which distinguish themselves from other nations and welfare states. A key assumption with this, within this model of modernity is predictability namely the unshakable correlation between cause and effect, research and truth. Historically, this modernity emerges towards the end of the 17th century as Europe comes out of destructive religious wars up to the mid-20th century. <clears throat> Accelerating from the end of the 20th century into the 21st is what Beck calls modernity too. This is modernity as globalization which intensely and vigorously attacks all barriers and hierarchies erected under the auspices of modernity one. So Beck's definition of modernity two, it refers to the erosion of clear boundaries, separating the markets, states, civilizations, cultures, and the life worlds of different peoples and religions, as well as the resulting worldwide situation of an involuntary confrontation with alien others. In other words, predictability has been replaced by unpredictability. Beck suggests that the rise of global religion has occurred because it is ideally suited to the new conditions of hyper-globalization that characterize modernity too. Religion, he says, has always held within itself the idea that we are global citizens of heaven and communicated this idea through the symbolic richness of its liturgy. 
that we could choose not to be held back or weighed down by what he calls the ballast of the modern nation state. This imagination, this religious imagination, finds its perfect outlet uh, in the fluid transnational flows of people and media communications in modernity too. Religion also speaks into the individual search and meaning for authenticity and enchantment and the intense personal reflexivity of the postmodern era. It effortlessly creates a sense of dwelling and belonging for those seeking community in the liminal spaces and crossing points of the world. As Beck Riley observes, the unintended consequence of modernity one is that it released religion from the shackles of both the nation state and the responsibility for finding answers to intractable moral problems and doing things like running politics and economics. Religion, therefore, becomes free to become the free-floating agent so perfectly at home in the de-territorialized spaces of modernity too. Beck suggests that the modern liberal democratic state, the love child of modernity one, if you like, is simply at a loss to understand this new modernity that it has bequeathed, and even more of a loss to know what to do about it. This is Beck's striking conclusion. For a modernity that's always putting itself at risk, he says, needs what he calls a cosmopolitan religious imagination and practice to co-create a new viable and sustainable modernity. Actually, that's my paraphrase of his book, but that's right. Um, he says, it's hardly possible to overestimate the potential of religions as cosmopolitan <coughs> actors, not just because of their ability to mobilize billions of people across barriers of nation and class, but because they exercise a powerful influence on the way people see themselves in relationship to the world. Above all, they represent a source of legitimation in the battle for the dignity of human beings, in a civilization at risk of destroying itself. So the even bigger question he raises is, is global religion up to this momentous task? We'll come back to that in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Beck's analysis of the two modernities is echoed by Jürgen Habermas and his concept of the post-secular public sphere. Habermas says, Again, using the word imagination, we need a new imagination of the public sphere that moves from a secular to a post-secular one, in which, quotes, the vigorous continuation of religion in a continually secularizing environment must be reckoned with. In which the vigorous continuation of religion in a continually secularizing environment must be reckoned with. Like Beck, he believes that the liberal democratic state no longer has a deep and resilient enough ontology that can command the loyalty and deep participation of its citizens. And without that, he says, it dies. He says the, 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 the modern liberal, democrat, liberal state needs to rediscover the wisdom, discernment, and discipline that are linked with religious sources because they are pre-political. They are independent and self-generating, outside the power of the newly diminished state and the ever voracious market. We need to reframe, he says, the relationship between faith and reason, from one-way domination by the one of the other to something that is more symbiotic. And I'm afraid there's not time to go into what he means by that. Attractive though it is, I think Habermas's post-secular vision of a reimagined public square is still over indebted to modernity one, i.e. the notion that we can control the public sphere with a kind of Kantian appeal to universal moral laws and principles that rely on the assent of all. His vision, I think, is rather too static and cognitive a view of the public sphere, rather than an organic and dynamic one, uh, which can come to terms with the diversity and hybridity of our globalized world modernity too. Indeed, my good friend and colleague Elaine Graham 
in a prescient critique of the whole post-secular debate, points out how much of the debate over a new post-secular public square is rooted in over-rational and abstract ideas. As a feminist theologian, she asks, where are the embodied and practical application of these ideas? And where are the voices and ideas of women who have been both silenced by religion and secularism? The post-secular debate, she says, is an opportunity to acknowledge and correct the often hidden gendered nature of our thinking about faith and reason, private and public, sacred and secular. So with Elaine's challenge also ringing in my ears, I now move to a more practical element of my discussion. In other words, what does a new global ethics of progressive change look like in practice or in, in an embodied state? So on to my third section, progressive change. What do I mean by progressive change? What do I mean by the word progressive? Well, this is an easy bit. This is a quick section. That's why I say easy. Um, the word progressive, like community, is a much overused and overhyped word, frustratingly imprecise. I'm using the term in a straightforward way to simply mean outward looking or outward facing. For me, a progressive view of the world is an outward facing and outward looking view. I'm influenced in this use by a concept called progressive localism, a term that emerges from political geography. It defines a vision of a vibrant and flourishing civil society based on cosmopolitan global ethics. David Featherstone et al. defined progressive localism thus. Progressive localism is outward looking and creates positive affinities between places and social groups negotiating global processes. These processes are expansive in their geographical reach and productive of new relations between places and social groups and can, possibly, <coughs> reconfigure existing communities around emergent agendas for social justice, participation, and tolerance. So that's the progressive bit done. Uh, the next 20 minutes or so is uh, the new global ethic. In his book, A God of One's Own, which is, what, which is what I've been drawing extensively from for this lecture, Beck highlights the fact that both violence and tolerance are historically endemic within religion. Religion, he says, responds to change and diversity in one of two ways. One is universalism, which is really only a form of fundamentalism that insists always or usually through the use of coercive violence on a single narrative and identity to which everyone else must to varying degrees conform. Of course, as he points out, secularism and the nation state are perfectly capable of acting like bad examples of monotheistic religion. So universalism is really the idea there's only one idea in town. Or, religion can face towards cosmopolitanism, which he describes thus. The cosmopolitan vision is based on the actually existing historical impurity of world religions. The recognition that they are intertwined, that they are both one and the same. Learning to see and understand ourselves through others' eyes does not mean that religions must sacrifice their own special nature, nor does it mean that they must all merge into a decadent, value-neutral, secular relativism. On the contrary, he says, they enrich their own religiosity, mutually reinforce one another, and in this way, they can practice and develop anew the public role of religion in the post-secular <laughs> modern era. <coughs> So I want to embellish Beck's description of cosmopolitan religion by picking out two dimensions of cosmopolitanism, sorry for this long word, uh, from my own and others' work, before applying it to three interlocking levels. Cosmopolitanism at the individual or micro scale, 
at the locality or meso scale and at the global or macro scale. The two dimensions of uh, progressive cosmopolitanism. The first is performativity and pragmatism, in a way going back to Temple. Beck's emphasis on the words practice and develop anew in the last quote highlights for me the necessary performativity of a new global ethics. We are not going to understand what it is through great abstract ideas or theories, or at least not in the first place. For me, and the research I've done for many years, mapping and analysing how ethics, values and beliefs are actually cashed out and performed in public spaces in often innovative and creative ways has long been a way by which we anticipate what politics and ethics will look like in the future. The idea of performativity also carries with it ideas of improvisation and experimentation that I like, and which restore for me the original meaning of the philosophical idea of pragmatism. When it comes to a post-secular progressive ethics, you'll only know what it looks like when we do it, and when we see it resonate across other spaces and networks. My second dimension is deconversion. Practice and experimentation involve a certain amount of deconversion. In other words, a, deliberately loosen, a deliberate loosening of our cultural, political, or religious worldview, but not a jettisoning, but a loosening. Deconversion is a term I've picked up from James Biello's work on intentional Christian communities in the States, sometimes called the new monasticism. These new emergent lay communities are planted in either very poor inner urban districts or the cultural wastelands of the exurbs by growing numbers of evangelical Christians. They are seeking a more authentic, challenging, and embodied form of religious identity and discipleship. According to Biello, deconversion involves a rejection of the cultural frameworks of evangelical Christianity, its obsession with materialism, and maintaining inward-looking subcultures at the expense of transforming wider society. They are also deconverting from a narrow biblical literalism that represents a superficial form of Christian discipleship, devoid of challenge and engagement in the complexity of the world. Biello intriguingly suggests that deconversion is part of a wider social phenomenon that expresses modernity's search for authenticity which so often takes the form of a flight from authority, from inherited paradigms of thought, and from various pressures to conform. Anyway, I'm suggesting that some form of deconversion becomes a strategy for practicing a post-secular global ethics. With these ideas in mind, I now turn to my three levels or spaces of progressive cosmopolitan ethics. The micro, the meso, the macro, or if you prefer, the individual, the locality, and the global. First of all, micro. Clearly, a cosmopolitan progressive global ethic has to begin with us as individuals. As I've just intimated, I believe it involves practicing an element of deconversion, being prepared to experiment and occupy new intellectual and political spaces offering both intellectual and emotional hospitality to others, but from within the wells of our own values and beliefs. This wellspring of values and beliefs I have called spiritual capital. In all scenarios of cosmopolitan ethics that I have investigated, we invest our spiritual capital with and alongside others for the sake of making an intervention for change, but also so that our own wells can be replenished. Spiritual capital, as the wellspring of our values, beliefs, and attitudes, is a vital component of a performed cosmopolitan global ethics because it can deeply influence the way we act in the public sphere. Current upheavals in Europe suggest that progressive or outward-looking spiritual capital is not the problem. There is a vast potential reservoir out there 
many people want to express actions and sentiments of cosmopolitan solidarity. But this cosmopolitan solidarity is fragile and needs nurturing. It is often physically prevented from coming to fruition by the organs and rules of the state, or discouraged by a media narrative that portrays fellow humans in need as scroungers, opportunists, or terrorists. One example of micro or individual cosmopolitan ethics that is merging uh, is from the borough of Hackney, where I live. Good old Hackney. The mayor of Hackney, as part of the borough's official response to the crisis in Europe, has approached Hackney citizens, part of the broad-based community organizing network made up of faith groups, schools, colleges, and trades unions, <coughs> to conduct an audit of its many hundreds of members to see who has got accommodation, even a single room, that it can offer, that it, the council can offer to Syrian and other refugees. Next space, the Meza or locality. Faith-based welfare projects and other impromptu community projects are also spaces where citizens can express and perform progressive spiritual capital. My research tracks how these spaces, for example food banks, have heightened in political significance since 2008. Not only as spaces where welfare is delivered with tact and compassion, but also where people meet to discuss the deeper structural reasons for poverty and inequality. In other words, these spaces are not only spaces of welfare delivery, but also spaces of interim community, or communitas, as Victor Turner might have said, between clients and volunteers, as well as spaces of political conscientization. I call these spaces, or well, I'm beginning to call them, the one-stop shop for a new cosmopolitan politics. Here is a real case study which I hope illuminates this idea of a one-stop shop. A Muslim-run food bank called Sufra, which has recently opened in the London borough of Brent. You can hear more of this case study on the William Temple Foundation website, and the address is there on the screen. Uh, this was part of a, of a um, <coughs> conference that we were looking at case studies of faith-based uh, welfare. Sufra is a polyphonic Middle Eastern word which has connotations of tablecloth, dining room, space of hospitality. 90% of the people who access their services are non-Muslim. His first client was a young man named Stephen, who on being given a bag of food had no idea how to cook it. This led Sufra to run and devise a 10-week cooking course for its clients which is now an accredited training scheme for 16 to 25 year olds in catering. 25 pe people have successfully found work as a result. <clears throat> Sofra run a vegetable box scheme, providing fresh produce at wholesale prices, and has started various food growing projects. 50% <clears throat> of Sofra's funding and resources comes from other faith groups, including local Catholic church and the Jewish community as well as a multi-faith workforce, and it has a multi-faith workforce, including people from non-religious backgrounds. Meanwhile, Sufra volunteers have been trained by staff from the council's housing department to offer advice on housing needs, something never seen before in Brent, apparently, and a radical change. Sufra was also a venue for pre-election hustings, where the issues of food poverty and homelessness were centre stage. Sufra's director, Mohammed, Mankami says the project feels like the end of the road for many who step across the threshold for the first time, but he wants it to be the start of a new journey. It also, he says, aspires to be an organization where people of different faiths and no faith could, quote, take part in social action together, fundraise together, and share resources together to create what he calls a sustainable common purpose. So if you have time to listen to it, it's a very inspiring story. Other local expressions of global progressive ethics being covered by the Foundation are evolving spaces of interfaith activism, of which our assistant director, Charlotte Dando, who's just sitting just there, is a leading UK figure. Charlotte has written our latest temple tract, 
about the ways interfaith work in the UK is evolving from what she calls the tea and samosa type of event into more dynamic networks where we discern the values and beliefs that unite us through direct forms of action. Charlotte writes, when interfaith work heads down the path of we're all the same really philosophy, it not only ignores the phenomenal and rich histories, the intricate and established practices, and the most deeply held convictions of each and every religious tradition, but it also misses an opportunity for spiritual growth, for deeper understanding, and our mutual transformation. But in order to do this, she says, truly safe spaces and truly inclusive forms of interfaith work must be fostered. For me, the key word out, or key words out of that quote uh, is the idea of mutual transformation. Finally, in the macro, you're doing very well. Where is the evidence, you may ask, of a global cosmopolitan ethics at work at the macro scale? To address this, I refer to a major template being developed in the work of my friend and other mentor, Professor John Atherton, who's very much alive, I'm pleased to say. John has devoted his academic life as one of the key major voices in public theology in the UK to analysing and locating the shifting relationship between religion, theology and public life, especially in relation to economics and increasingly more recently in relation to human well-being. He's always been interested in the progressive benefits to society as a whole when you bring religiously based ideas and beliefs in human well-being and transformation into rigorous and critical contact with empirical indicators of economic and social well-being and the arguments and insights from economics, history and social psychology. This is precisely the aim of John's latest book, Challenging Religious Studies, The Wealth, Well-Being and Inequalities of Nations. He reminds the religious studies world of the extraordinary contributions made to human well-being and development since the 1800s by economics and scientific development. What he calls, after Fogel, cycles of techno-physiological change. Think of the advances in human life expectancy, health and well-being, and the lifting of billions out of poverty, which then allows them potential to live creative and fulfilling lives. But there is also a profound paradox lying at the heart of this exponential growth in human development, which is growing inequality between and within <coughs> nations and its knock-on effects, including increased social and mental stress and breakdown in community trust that growing inequality brings. Part of the reason for this paradox, John suggests, is that economics has become disconnected from its moral and ethical roots, what Adam Smith called the moral sentiments preferring instead to see itself as a quasi-positivistic science based on supposedly rational predictions about human behavior and preferences. So this is where John says religion has a great deal to offer. It offers more realist insights into the complexity of the human psyche and soul and the practices and outcomes of real happiness. But it also offers the necessary moral energy and vision to work for progressive change. Thus John is arguing for a reconnection or reconvergence of disciplines and insights, particularly between economics and religious studies. He calls this interdisciplinary approach the art of living in more than one place at once. In other words, being able to see and inhabit the world from a perspective other than your own. But also see that second quote, we should be sensitive and seasoned travellers at ease in many places, but one must have a home. John's book extrapolates his theory of how historical cycles of waves in which religion, politics, and economics have combined to progressive global effect with the case study of the United States. During three cycles from roughly, 70, from roughly 1730 to the present day, the notions of equal rights and happiness, with a Y, so central to American democracy, were framed and developed and subsequently embodied in the abolition of slavery in the 19th century and the birth of the civil rights movement in the 20th century. 
John says there are three stages to each one of these waves. The start of each wave is triggered by a period of turbulent change, war, revolution, or economic crisis. Political and economic upheaval is reflected in individual stress, with people feeling that they are losing their bearing and identities. This period sees the intensification of religious beliefs and practices and the ushering in of new ethics and theological principles. In the second stage of these waves, these new ethics and principles create the moral drive for new and powerful political and economic programs and movements, all conducive to achieving greater well-being. The third and final stage ends with the ethics and politics nourished by religious revivals being challenged by new movements and their associated political coalitions going into decline. John also brings in the power of technology at each stage. The boosting of each new wave involves the progressive harnessing of a new technology. Fascinatingly, for the, for the purposes of this lecture, the jury is out on whether or not we are in a fourth wave of progressive change, despite the apparent conditions being ripe for one. So is the current era of uncertainty I'm referring to a protracted turbulence bequeathed by the previous wave? Are there forces of change already at work? beneath the surface, as it were, but the tipping point has yet to be reached. For example, were Occupy and the Arab Spring, fleeting moments of hope snuffed out by ruthless political and economic powers? Or were they harbingers of an already present, but as yet unmanifested, progressive global ethics, growing, as it were, underground? In the spirit of Temple's realism, I do think there are signs of hope, and one example that addresses climate change is what one might call the Francis Naomi phenomenon. So I'm going to end with this case study of macro global progressive change. The end is in sight. Earlier this year, the Vatican launched Pope Francis's much anticipated encyclical on climate change, simply entitled Laudate Si, Praise Be. It calls for swift action to save the planet from environmental ruin by linking climate change to poverty. Based on both theological insights and the latest scientific modelling and research, it is a vision for the common good which Francis hopes will shift our political culture away from short-termism and a throwaway economy that produces waste and a disregard for human and non-human life. The huge issues posed by climate change are not ultimately political, he says, but moral. The Pope suggests we persistently make the wrong choices. Instead of respecting the norms of scarcity and balance, and choosing to live a simpler and therefore more fulfilling life, we refuse to accept any limits to our right to choose and consume. Part of the political momentum created by this document is the way it has garnered rave reviews from the secular media and commentators, including Naomi Klein. Klein is a global environmental equal rights campaigner. Her latest book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate, is the secular doppelganger to Laudate Si. Reflecting on the Pope's intervention, she says, it is the logic of domination and endless greed that has created a broken economy and is breaking the planet. The way out of both crises is another economic model that lives within nature's limits. Not only is she unapologetically endorsing his analysis and message, but she accepted an invitation from the Vatican to take part in a multi-sector conference over the summer entitled People and Planet First, the Imperative to Change Course. Why this might work as a macro case study, I suggest, is that both activists, if we can call them that, have practiced a partial and strategic deconversion of their worldview in order to create a new creative space for ideas and action to emerge. Let's be clear, this is not an uncritical merging of the Catholic Church and the climate change movement. As Klein herself points out, there are huge differences that remain over issues like marriage equality, reproductive rights, and freedom, to name just a few. But there is a clear willingness by both parties to nevertheless emphasize what it is they agree on, rather than what disunites them. For me, it is an exciting example of a new post-secular global ethics, where scientific arguments, secular activism, and deep philosophical and religious wisdom are brought together in compelling resonance. Sorry, that was a quote there. 
It is a deeply pragmatic and ethical contribution to the common good, where two charismatic global thinkers have recognized the added value each brings to their perspective on a complex and exist existence-threatening phenomenon. Of course, all this is also carefully calibrated to make a big contribution to the forthcoming United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Paris later this year. So it's time to draw these threads together. You'll be relieved to know. I wonder how you would answer my question in the title of my lecture. What prospects for a new global ethic of progressive change? For me, there is no shortage of progressive spiritual capital in the world that is willing to experiment in a post-secular pragmatic ethics and politics of hope. Despite the demonic forces of religious and political hatred and economic short-termism that seems so intent on saying, Tina, there is no alternative to our universalist perspective. The question is really, are there enough public spaces for a cosmopolitan perspective to gain traction? to join up the micro, meso and macro levels so that they create a critical mass or tipping point of performed ethics that can then be theorized and to some extent universalized. If religion can do, can do one useful thing, I suggest, it is good at curating these new spaces, helping to organize them into coherent projects that tell a different story of a progressive and hopeful public space and then stitching them together. This is what I hope in the spirit of William Temple to continue to research. And I see this professorial post as a means and platform to do so. But I will need the help and expertise of many others who are willing to join this task. Thank you for listening. So uh, Elaine Graham, Professor Elaine Graham, who first introduced this university to Chris, is our respondent tonight. But I've negotiated with Elaine that we will take your questions first. If you could indicate whether you'd like to ask a question, and that will tell me whether we need to group them, because limited time is available. So if you think you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We're going to start, we'll take, we'll take these two here at the front first please. A microphone is heading now in your direction. If you can ask, they're both down on the second row here, in the middle. Just pass it along, thank you very much. If you could as succinctly as possible please express your question. I will only intervene if your question is too long and Chris will then respond. Thank you, Chris. I go along with much of what you say. My question is, what is your definition, if that's the right word, of the category religion or the religious? You started off with statistics, which was about basically religious identity. question. Obviously, religion is much deeper than that. Chris, take the microphone. Uh, yes, of course, um, progressive must be transgressive. And I probably didn't bring that out enough in my, what I was saying, but I suppose it's there for me in the concept of pragmatism, which does sound quite a boring word, but actually if you unpack it, it's, it's full of potential because it is about experimentation and innovation. And I think, therefore, to experiment and innovate clearly involves um, an element of transgression. And the idea from Greg about, well, how am I using religion? Um, I suppose I'm using religion as a, uh, in, in very much influenced by Beck as a kind of global actor, political, cultural uh, force, if you like, that's within the world that is expressed both in terms of how people of faith practice their religion, 
but it's also expressed in terms of um, an imagination, an imaginary. And it's also expressed, of course, in um, symbolic richness and liturgy. So, interestingly enough, Beck's whole <coughs> musing on the power of cosmopolitan religion um, occurs, if anyone's read the book, A God of My Own, when he's looking at the coronation, if that's the right word, of uh, the previous pope, um, um, Rick Ratzinger. Uh, and he's amazed at this kind of global televised event that sort of seems to draw the whole world together. Everyone's watching it. And it also kind of seems to speak as well uh, beyond and outside its kind of particular cultural references. So there's something here about, I think, about the new global media and how the media, how we, how we use media also impacts what religion is and how we, how we regard it. I hope that answers your question. Any more hands? This one here, thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you very much for a very um, interesting um, lecture. Um, I'm a Baha'i, um, and you did mention the Baha'i Baha faith, but um, the sort of statistics doesn't... Um, are you aware that, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Baha'i faith is the second most widespread religion in the world after Christianity? Um, that's according to the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's not the Baha'i saying that. No. So, um, and, you know, the Baha'i faith um, um, promotes, you know, one God, unity of religion, and unity of mankind. So. Um, how do you think, where, where do you think the Baha'i faith um, or the Baha'is can, well, we would very much want to um, help you in your, uh, um, to, to harmonise the world, Thank you. To, um, to make like, more unity in the world. So, Thanks very much. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for correcting me uh, on, on the Baha'i statistics. I mean, I was only using what the, uh, what the Pew Research Foundation had discovered. Um, Yes, I'm sure that the Baha'i's faith does, in kind of in a way, epitomise and embody a lot of what I'm saying. I suppose a word of caution to myself, which certainly Ulrich Beck is very strong on, but also I think uh, Charlotte brought out in her quote, is that this isn't a kind of um, annulling of difference. This isn't a kind of um, you know, washing away what, what's, what's, what makes us different. Um, and one of the reasons why I found, I think, Hans Kung's approach to trying to devise a global ethic, which was to look at all the sort of scriptural traditions of all the world faiths and find out what was their common message. Um, and the message was, well, the golden ethic, you know, treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. But that didn't seem to really generate much political purchase. And the main critique, I think, of that is that it kind of, you know, just merged all religions into one kind of amorphous mass. So. If we're talking about um, a progressive, global, ethical, cosmopolitan uh, ethic, we've got to maintain those, those identities, but, but, but try and turn them into a, a cosmopolitan direction rather than what, what Beck would call the universalist perspective, universalism perspective, where your identity and your version of the truth is the one that everyone else eventually has to come to. Uh, there are two uh, right up near the back. We'll send those in microphones or vigorous exercise. <coughs> Which I think when you ask your question, if you hold your microphone up yep. like a relay runner, the person directly behind you will take it from you. Excellent. Um, thanks. That was a really, really interesting lecture. I just wanted to really interested about how you sort of like postulate all your theories alongside like economic yes. uh, arguments. I just wanted to, to get your opinion on do you are you are you worried that maybe um, this new global ethic could be come sub subsumed under sort of productivist uh, ethics? So, for example, um, could the forces of capitalism, which by no client says no book are so strong, and uh, indeed talks about people like Richard Branson who sort of uh, subsumed who are capitalists but tout the message of environmental responsibility like while well, doing nothing about it. Do you think this sort of new global ethic could become subsumed under production, under economic sort of growth and things like that, and actually 
the resistance of spiritual capital actually takes place within the realm of production rather than in antagonistic opposition to it. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. And um, one of the main criticisms I always face when I use the concept of spiritual capital is they say, well, how can you put you know, a monetary kind of noun against something called spiritual? But I hope I've managed to show that it is you know, a vitally important <coughs> element of social capital, human capital, and economic capital. Uh, yes, there's, there is always that, um, there's always that temptation. Um, but I do think that um, this is, for me, the way to answer that is, was my last point is, is if there are kind of individualistic you know, uh, alternatives presented, then they can get quite easily picked off. Um, uh, but I think what I'm trying to propose, and I've no idea how to propose it, because if I did, I guess I'd be you know, getting the Nobel Peace Prize or something, <laughs> but somehow we've got to have a vision that joins up all these different um, uh, spaces of performing, performative cosmopolitan ethics, um, so that it then becomes a critical mass, and then that, that becomes a new, the basis of a new theory. So I, I very much am with you, Rebecca. I think you know, we, we need a kind of modernity three, and that new modernity will only be forged when we co-create, uh, as Temple says, you know, a commonwealth of value. So until that message finally gets through to everyone, uh, there's always that danger that uh, that won't happen. But one hopes, and this is where the kind of, suppose you could say, the spirit of hope <laughs> that Temple managed to find <coughs> even, even in the darkest days of the Second World War when he kind of you know, envisaged what a new uh, kind of society could look like. The hope is that there's always that potentiality that's beneath the surface that will emerge. Um, but what's interesting for me is the way that religion uh, seems to be much more uh, acutely aware of, of its role, hopefully, that it can do to, to kind of create these new spaces of, of cosmopolitan ethics. That's, that's the argument I'm trying to make. Thank you for your question. Um, hi, Chris. Um, hi. Hi, Hayley. Keep the MP6 and get Hayley Prasad to your letter. Um, I've got two questions for you. Um, the first question is, if we are un universalising performed ethics then, uh, and we want to maintain that cosmopolitan um, difference amongst people, how do we draw in things such as um, Eastern philosophies and religions, uh, or, or are we talking basically about a very uh, European, US paradigm here? Um, because if we're going to maintain all of that, how do we then begin to universalise? Um, and then my second question is, what do you think those public spaces are going to look like in which we begin to inhabit this and explore it? Thank you. Um, well, I'm very aware, and this is why I positioned myself right at the beginning of the, uh, of the lecture as a, as, a, as a kind of Christian public theologian who's, who's open to all sorts of other influences, but I'm not a, 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 an expert on other religious traditions. When I said at the end, you know, I, I think I certainly need... Um, a lot of help and guidance from other people. I was really primarily thinking of uh, my colleagues in the Religious Studies Department here at Chester, who, if, if this resonates in any way with their kind of understanding of their own religious tradition that they, that they have intimate knowledge of, then we can begin to, if you like, unpack what that means, what this kind of new vision and politics means from within <coughs> the higher perspective, uh, a Muslim perspective. Jewish perspective. I mean, I know, I know work has been done on that, but um, I really concur with, with John, John Atherton that the, the, you know, religious studies has really got a, a really good opportunity to, to do some very exciting and creative work around this agenda. Um, so I hope that happens very much. And the new public spaces, well, um, I tried to give a couple of examples with the, with the food bank, so for food bank. Uh, if you read Charlotte and Phil Lewis's latest Temple Tract. Charlotte has a couple of really good case studies, one called The Feast, uh, and the other called The Intercultural Leadership School. For me, the locality is that the middle space is actually where um, individual ideas come into play and hopefully then begin to have a kind of global impact. So the space globally, uh, for me, was, was, was this case study of, of the Pope and. Uh, Naomi Klein, who you would have thought a year ago that would have happened. Uh, and it kind of, it's kind of intellectual space, it's a political space, it's not necessarily a, a space place, if you see what I mean. But I think it, you know, we have to look spatially, but we have to look intellectually at where these new uh, 
forms of thinking and of praxis are emerging. Do you have any ideas? Did you have anything in your mind when you... No, I'm just interested to see if, you'd, if it got as far as that in your form of formulating that thinking about what that might look like. Not yet, know. but hopefully the, late, the, the book that um, Rob alluded to, I'm writing with two um, <coughs> very creative uh, human geographers who have got a lot more knowledge and understanding of global context where this is happening. So, um, and we've got a call for papers as well at the next um, American Associated American Geographers in 2016, which we hope will attract uh, papers from other contexts, not just Christian or Muslim ones. Thank you. So the clock is now speeding, I'm afraid, towards a glass of wine, so <laughs> drinks are also available in the foyer. And so we don't have time for more questions, but we do have time, please, to invite Professor Elaine Graham, our respondent, <coughs> uh, to give a vote. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by adding my own personal congratulations to Chris as a friend and colleague of many years standing on this occasion of his inaugural lecture as William Temple Professor of Religion and Public Life. Tonight marks not only another landmark on the tremendous collaborative journey undertaken by the William Temple Foundation and the University of Chester, which began in 2009, but of course it is an entirely appropriate recognition of Chris's own personal achievements as a scholar, teacher, and researcher. You heard in Rob's introduction about some of the career points on Chris's own journey to tonight's destination. And in a sense, the magnificent lecture he's just delivered speaks for itself, is its own testimony, is the most effective statement or inventory of his own intellectual influences. And listening to him tonight and having taught, examined, supervised, edited, co-written with him over many years, I can hear many of those influences resonating in what he had to say. But I also know that like the best scholars, whose work always bears both the imprint of early passions and formative experiences and later influences, Chris is also continually reworking and adapting those influences for new contexts and new situations. But some of those enduring passions as they rework themselves are these. Firstly, his enduring love of literature and poetry. I think of his secret love of R.S. Thomas, which in later years has taken him into areas of popular culture and latterly an interest in screenplay writing, all of which reflect a key characteristic of his work, I think, which is an interest in narrating the storied nature of human lives and landscapes. Thinking back to when I first met him, when he was completing his PhD with Professor John Atherton, and it's such a, a pleasure to have you here tonight, John. Uh, Chris's PhD on new churches in Milton Keynes, there was already that fascination with the way social and economic relationships were shaped decisively by space and place, and how our sense of sacred space is so fundamental to the way we inhabit the built environment. And whilst he often seems to fit, say, fair, sit fairly lightly to its institutional forms, Chris, I think, does have an attachment to the possibilities of religious faith as transformational, hence his work in spiritual capital, and especially the ability of religion to motivate and mobilise people to journey out beyond their own boundaries and work with others in building the common good. I think you heard a lot of that tonight. And finally, although this by no means exhausts the list of Chris's academic virtues, there's that tremendous versatility, <coughs> uh, that ability to conjure entangled fidelities that he spoke of, his flair for working across disciplinary boundaries, to think and work collaboratively in the most generous and open-hearted of ways. Over the past few years, Chris has built some formidable networks, and it's been a privilege to participate in some of those, and to see the respect he commands, not just from Christian theologians and scholars of religion, but philosophers, <coughs> urban and human geographers and political scientists, as well as legions of practitioners and policy makers. He really does bring theory and practice together. And the significance of that work and its reach is outstanding. But I can't really go any further in my comments without mentioning William Temple. 
I think Chris and I both share uh, that sense that we stand in a particular tradition of Anglican social thought, even though each of us in our own ways is augmenting and remaking it. And again, that is represented so vividly, I think, in actual friendships, conversations and networks. There's a kind of chain of memory going on here, I think, as we stand on the shoulders of giants uh, from Manchester days, the tradition of Preston, Atherton, Dyson, back through them to Temple and Tawney, and here at Chester now too, the Anglican foundation that the Vice-Chancellor referred to, and its fundamental commitment to scholarship that's dedicated to the service and enrichment of the whole community beyond higher education, beyond the academy. But academic life, of course, is more than simply a complex kind of ancestor worship. And I think Temple would have had much to celebrate and admire in the way Chris has taken his legacy and continues to take it forward. That incarnational activist and liberal spirit of Christian realism, liberal in its best sense, dialogical, collaborative, rooted in but not held captive to its traditions, and a way of doing theology that's deeply committed to enabling the voices and energies of faith to speak clearly and decisively into those common spaces of our public life. So Chris, we're deeply appreciative of your lecture tonight and look forward to all the many achievements that await us and you in the future. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Chris.